Good morning. Uh, thanks for making the time to be here. You know, as uh, you know or should know, we're in the middle of our strategic planning. And with uh, transformation uh, going on, us restructuring divisions and uh, moving toward the organization of the future, it's important that you know that your input is valuable in the strategic planning process and in the transformation process. Today we'll uh, maybe tangentially refer to transformation, but this is really about the strategic planning process that, uh, that we're going through. I want to start out by talking about a small number of the really great things that we're doing here at Houston Community College. And you know because you're part of this. You know, we are a leader nationally in awards for minority students. And that's typically where urban colleges fall. But they don't all fall at between number one and five in the areas that we fall in. If you look at the makeup of our community, there are some communities across the country that aren't too different from us, yet they're not up in this range in terms of performance. So our focus is on the right things. Our success uh, is, is pretty good. Strategic planning isn't about fix, fixing things. Neither is transforma transformation. Uh, it's about the future. It's about getting right for what's coming. Uh, I was listening to a TED Talk the last couple of days. Uh, I, uh, I got a new Apple TV and for those of you who know me, I, I, everything new that comes out of Apple that's affordable, I buy and I, I play with it. And I downloaded the uh, TED Talk app and I watched some TED Talks and I listened to a neuroscientist uh, talk about minimizing risk. And he, he, we all look at situations that have happened in the past and we look at postmortems and we have a, put a lot of time into talking about what could we have done differently to help us reach our goal in a smoother way or prevented an accident? Um, and it, it, typically when you look at an accident, for example, you eliminate the things that did not happen in order to find the solution. A lot of effort we, that goes into that organizationally. This TED Talk talk about pre-mortems. It's about projecting yourself to the future and looking back, when you go to the future, you sh need to realize that the tools that you have in the future are a lot different than the tools you have today. So you have more robust information systems. You have more accurate data. It's very frustrating for us today when we don't have that data that we want instantaneously. Right? We're getting spoiled because we go to uh, some websites and we push a few, click on a few buttons and we get some data. And then we ask our uh, IER department, I go over to Martha and say, well, I want the data of this group with this characteristic between this time and this time. Can you get it to me? It's nine o'clock, can you get it to me by 10? I won't tell you what she says. <laughs> but going forward, if we, if doing a pre-mortem, if we put ourselves out in the future and we look at what data do we wish we have had to make the decision three years out? We can come back to today without a magic time machine and put together a plan that gives Martha time to work on the data for us so we can have it in our portfolio to make decisions. When we go to the future and think about losing our car keys, we will decide that we should keep our car keys in maybe one or two places all the time. That way in the future when we can't find them, we go to that place and the keys will be there. Not quite that simple, but the analogy fits when you're looking at strategic planning. We know that we're going to grow in demands from our community and our students. 80% of the jobs are gonna require post-secondary uh, education and I hear people in the community talk about well 80% of the jobs the community members say not all kids need to go to college. We are college. A certificate in a workforce program is college. We're going through a shift in society where 
we're beginning to realize that uh, a workforce degree, a workforce award, a certificate is STEM. It is college. You have to know math and science to weld. You have to know metallurgy to weld. So it's not just flipping on a switch and burning a rod. When you're going to be working with the metals of today and of the future, it's going to be far more scientific than building a, uh, fixing a fence, a fence post. We established our mission uh, last December. It's been um, nearly a year. And, and our strategic plan is being aligned to fulfill this, of uh, being successful in, in student completion, in workforce and academic programs. I don't understand how some think that you can have a workforce program without a very strong academic program. They're based on science. It's based on STEM. There's a lot of, a lot of press being, uh, time being given to STEM, and rightfully so. But without the arts, without liberal arts, without a, a design thinking embedded in that, we're going to be uh, bound to the past solutions because the new solutions aren't just in the equation. It's thinking about how to apply the equation differently. So the arts are very much a part of what we do. Um, in history tells us that if we don't study history, we'll make the same mistakes. And we're not about making mistakes. So our vision is the starting point for our strategic plan, well, one of the starting points that feed into building the new strategic plan. We know that in our transformation, we've gone from centers of delivery to centers of excellence. We've talked about that before, and I've shared it with, uh, with you before. There is a difference in that the centers of excellence are networked. We have a concentration of expertise. There's a difference from the centers of delivery where uh, we're centering excellence, the, the workforce expertise, the technical expertise to run a career program, but we're having nodes within our own organization. So even though the center of excellence in automotive technology might be at Northeast, in one of the Northeast College locations, that does not mean there won't be an automotive program at Southwest. We're going to have our own feeder system. So if we look at uh, the, the orbits around the nucleus of HCC, the furthest orbit might be middle schools, and the next orbit in will be high schools to feed to the different locations. And the next orbit in is going to be our own educational sites. And we will be developing through the strategic plans guidance how we do that, how do we organize ourselves, campuses, the big footprints, then big boxes like retail stores and malls, and then storefronts. And what do we do with storefronts? So if you look at retailers at how they operate, Gap has small stores, big stores, and then superstores. What determines that? What do they stock in the stores? So we have a lot to, that we can learn from how retail works. How do they price their, um, their merchandise? How do we price our programs? Does it make sense for us in the strategic plan and our centers of excellence to have a sale this month? We're going to have a sale on tuition for nursing. Of course, you have to have the grades to get in. But is that a strategy we can use? So part of what Dr. Herod's group is working on is capturing all of the inputs that we should consider. In 2015, designing a plan that's going to take us to 2020. The first step of the strategic plan began with transformation. We had 851 total engagements for transformation to get started. The, excuse me, to get the input to transformation. Based on those inputs, we then formulated what the starting point of transformation was. And, and also understand that transformation is not predetermined. I get asked frequently, well, what is this organization going to look like? It, to be certain, I've got an organization chart 
mapped out in a folder in my, in my file cabinet. Of about 80, 85% of what our organization, based on functionality, should look like. None of us is so smart that we can figure out the entire part of the organization. And what's valid and needed in 2015 might be archaic in 2016 or 2017. So transformation will be a very long journey. It'll be so long that we'll never get to the end. We're going to enter an era of continuous improvement as we move towards getting uh, our submission ready for the Baldrige Award in Excellence. So we started with transformation and we looked at the themes that came to us from our meetings. Now, I've made this presentation several times to different groups, so I apologize if I skip over things, but these are the big ticket items that came out of our meetings. These are the things that transformation will take us to. This is our dream goal. Some of this we affect by our behavior. We can't name, I guess we could name ourselves the recognized leader as a community college. But that's really something that somebody else bestows on us. And they do that as a result of what we do. Our strategic plan is not only based on a structural and organizational perspective, we're also looking at the symbolic perspective. We're looking at the political perspective, not political as in the elections that just happened a couple of days ago, but political in terms of how organizations work within themselves and with those organizations, the externalities around them. There's also a lot of symbolism that's going to be in the strategic plan. What are the perspectives that everyone in the organization has? When I first arrived, 20%, based on a survey, uh, done at HCC, 20% of our staff and faculty would not recommend HCC to family and friends. That number is way too high. It needs to be zero. So from a symbolic standpoint, that number is not acceptable. And part of the strategic plan is to drive change to elevate and recognize our core values that are listed up here. The unification of the system is happening by organizing the centers of excellence to have nodes across the system, by providing a common management of our faculty. So these, these core values are all important and is something that we should live every day. We also look to behavioral competencies. How do we exhibit those core values? Now, you can't tell someone, I really care about you, uh, and then cross them in the hallway or in an elevator and not say a word to them the rest of the month. So what we say has to match with what we do. And as we go through this continual change, we need to be able to communicate effectively. And I know that some of you believe that we're not sharing enough with you on our organizational change and transformation. We're not sharing because we don't know yet. And again, there's different types of organizational um, change agents. There's those that can come in, interview 50 people and come up with a new org chart and say, based on the preponderance of what I was told, these are, this is where we should be. But that document is outdated the day it gets published because things change. If things aren't changing, the organizational, the organization will die. We're always reacting to the externalities. You know, think about us as a highway and think about the traffic that changes on a highway many times throughout the day and certainly over from day to day. We're gonna be more efficient uh, our costs are important. The taxpayers that we uh, rely on 
are relying on us to make sure that we are good stewards of the resources that they provide. That's in the strategic plan. That's in our transformation. I've gone through two budget cycles with, uh, in the first budget cycle, our team, you, saved about $14 million of uh, overrun on the budget. We were able to get a budget approved that had um, no increase over the prior year's budget with the reductions that, that I just mentioned. Two years in a row, we've asked for the same amount of money in our budget, and we continue to grow with students, with completers, with transformation. We are, in fact, very good stewards of the taxpayers' money. And we have resulted, the last fiscal year, with some of the budgeted money that we didn't spend going to fund balance. So just because we have it approved doesn't mean we spend it. And the, the way we're able to accomplish that is by being more aligned, by sharing resources. Resources being our talent is the biggest resource. You know, the largest single expense we have is, is due to people. And we share resources with our people. Innovation is starting, but we just have very small glimpses of it yet. When we get our student services department restructured, our police department restructuring in place. We're going to start, start seeing uh, time become available for transformation, for new ideas to share across the system. Now, we, we, we do have some of that already, but it's going to happen in a, in a more meaningful uh, and more repetitive way. So we're looking at the one big thing that we want to do is increase student success, is focus on the student experience. There's a constant debate I have going with the, uh, it's a friendly debate, but it's a debate nonetheless with the board of the trustees in terms to performance metrics. We will put up a dashboard that'll have numbers on it, but when we meet and talk as a functional organization, if we focus on too many things, we'll focus on nothing. We'll be looking at numbers, but we won't be looking underneath the covers. What do those numbers mean? It is possible to focus on one thing and have that lift the entire organization. If we focus on the student experience, I argue that that will make us a better educational institution. It'll make us more successful at budgeting. It will make us more relevant in the workplace, in the marketplace. It'll make us have uh, improved relationships with universities to partner with us. It'll make us have uh, improved relationships with school districts where they want to come partner with us instead of wanting to partner with other organizations. <clears throat> That's already playing out. I understand that at a recent conference uh, that when our team was presenting our partnerships with universities for engineering, they were approached from people in the audience after the presentation, uh, they were approached with people offering partnerships with us from outside of state in the same way that we have our current partnerships with UT Tyler and Texas A&M. So what we're doing there is already innovative and it's being recognized by others. Student success is what drives all this. The centers of excellence are a big part of our strategic plan. What do they become? which ones are in place now, which ones need to be nurtured. And the cost of delivery is going to be very affordable for us as we focus on those centers of excellence. As an example, we have projects ongoing already where 3D printers are being looked at for multiple applications. It's not just manufacturing. It's healthcare. It's education. 
it's oil and gas. With play, strategic placement of these devices, we can share them. So yeah, we can buy um, a small scale printer, 3D printer that prints a few plastic pieces. And, that, and in fact, we already have that. We've had that for some time. But what about us, how, how about us pooling our resources to buy a large printer that uses some metals, some other materials to print from? Pharmaceutical companies are using 3D printers to print customized medicine. We already have the uh, beginnings of a project to use 3D printing to, to print prosthetic devices in a partnership between Coleman College, uh, HCC's Coleman College, and Shriners Children's Hospital. A lot of great things going on, being driven by and made affordable by our Center, Center of Excellence concept. The whole idea of the Centers of Excellence is to take 3,100 out of the middle, out of the conversation. So when we looked at how we communicate, what we wanted is to get rid of the red channels here, where you have to go through a central communication to be able to access resources. We want the green path that we show up here to be the mode of choice. We want the centers of excellence to talk to each other about new applications. Innovation isn't going to happen and in fact will be harmed if we add a restriction that it needs to come through some authority that sits at 3100. What we want is independence in thought and in action, naturally within the boundaries, within the budgets and between the rules that we have. But we won't be innovative if we require everything to come through some central authority. This is all part of the strategic plan that Dr. Herod's working through and uh, Dr. Edwards are, are leading. The challenges that we have are substantial. When you look at our environment, this is Texas, um, and a cohort that started in 2003 in order to get them through graduation. The numbers are dismal. For every 100 eighth graders, 69 graduate, from high school, 53 enter college, and 20 graduate from college. Out of those 20, it's shocking to see that only four have an AES or a AAS, and only one has a certificate. This doesn't show the number of students that go into the higher ed system in Texas that already have a bachelor's degree that are going back to get an associate's degree so they can get a higher paying job. We're charged with taking that number of five graduates from a college that start out in that cohort of 100, we're charged with taking that number of five and tripling it. And I got this data handed to me from the commissioner of higher ed, Dr. Paredes, we, made a, we were uh, keynote speakers at the same conference. And, uh, the goal of the coordinating board is to increase those numbers by allowing us to play in a more meaningful way. But remember this ratio because this is the ratio that I just showed you and it's easier to remember than the larger numbers. 10, 7, 5, 2. For every 10 eighth graders, seven finish college, uh, high school, five go to college and two finish. So a 20% yield on any investment of time is not very good. Investment of the tremendous resources that the state is putting into education. This isn't a 20% return, it's a 20% yield, which is a lot different. For HCC, our centers of excellence will be our focus as we move forward. Again, this is leading up and feeding the strategic plan. So these numbers show that the graduates of 2014 are health sciences by far the largest number, logistics with 30 graduates. Now, what this allows us to do, and, and 2014 was our very first snapshot in this manner, because we didn't think about centers of excellence before. We were looking at total number of graduates, graduates by college, 
Uh, and these numbers are plus or minus uh, a few students. I don't want uh, to put a disclaimer up here that uh, these numbers aren't entirely accurate, but they are representative of where we are. I said we might be off by a few students. But what this allows us to do is to focus strategically on what our goal is. Instead of setting a goal of a 1% increase in total graduates, we can say we want a 15% increase in logistics and maybe a 2% in healthcare, 2% in engineering, 10% uh, in digital information. We're going to get more granular. We're going to be coupled much tighter with the private sector and what their needs are to try to align our programs and our throughput to what industry needs. Now, this doesn't say that a student can't sign up to major in anything they want. They absolutely can and will, and we want that for them. But when they come to us and ask, <clears throat> what's the hot ticket item right now? Most of what we say is anecdotal. It's something we read in the newspaper, it's something we heard somebody say. We're going to start responding to that based on data. We're going to have this type of information up on our website. What are the graduation trends for HCC look like as we formulate our strategic plan? With our associate's degrees, we can see that we had a significant uptick in 2015. We're doing some things right. All we tend to hear most of the time is what we're doing wrong. This is huge. There's not very many colleges that can claim they've had this type of an increase in, uh, in their awards. When we, when we layer on the certificates, we look at some tapering down. 2015 looks good. We're not getting smaller. We actually stopped getting smaller and got a little bit bigger in the certificate awards. Now, this is not a reflection in terms of what was happening before. This is not a reflection that bad things were happening. What this merely shows is that the planning, the goal of the planning was different. The goal was not as granular, and it wasn't unfocused, as focused in certain areas. When we do that through the centers of excellence, through student experience, by having students, by behaving in a way that draws students in, it allows us to work with our, um, align our resources to the students' needs in terms of getting out into the workforce, getting into the university that they want to uh, get into. By doing that, we end up with bigger numbers. By working smarter, we, uh, we can find those students that have qualified for a degree but haven't applied for it and reach out to them and ask them if we can help them apply for that degree, help them get out and get into the workplace or to the university. When we look at uh, core completers and other awards, we also had a big jump. Now, some of this has to do with how we capture data but a significant increase was experienced outside of that. So if we took out some of the new metrics that we added, we still had a very healthy increase in our awards. So 2015 was a good year. The strategic plan is considering that. That's this, these are all input points to that plan. The coordinating board wants 60% of the students going to college, excuse me, of the students graduating to have a post, a high school to have a post-secondary degree by 2030. As we, and the tagline is uh, 60 by 30 Texas. As we move forward with our strategic plan, you'll learn of our tagline. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't want to begin to guess that the last part would be 20, because that's only five years away. And, and when you start thinking about strategic plans, and a lot of them are 2020, and you think about 20 being only five years away is very eye-opening uh, in terms of what we need to set our goals realistically. 
uh, to be. We're going to align what we do with what our strategic plan, how we function with our strategic plan, with the state's st strategic plan, with what industry wants. There's a lot of things going into the work uh, that's ongoing right now that we hope to wrap up in the next 45 days. I'll let Dr. Dr. Maybe sooner, maybe sooner. Um, so imagine HCC 2019, that 2019, you know, that's our tagline right now because of the, the horizon of our strategic plan. Strategic plans in the past used to have a very long horizon. You could set a five-year plan, and some even longer. With the upheaval that's caused by technology, any plan that's longer than three years, probably three to four years, probably isn't going to work. Will have to be amended and updated. And even this plan, as solid as it's going to be, will have to be looked at on an annual basis for tweaking because things will change. There are going to be new disciplines next year that don't exist today. Uh, I was speaking a couple of days ago uh, and I shared with a group of students all of the, the new positions that are going to be in high demand as a result of autonomous automobiles that are on our highways today, uh, semi-autonomous today, fully autonomous by 2019. And those jobs are going to be in high demand before those cars hit the street, so to speak. So things are going to change and we have to be flexible. So the strategic plan is going to be a little vaguely worded in some areas because it'll give us room for flexibility. This is where we are on input on the process, uh, and we're getting into the nuts and bolts of the strategic planning process. Uh, so I'm going to hand the presentation over to Dr. Herod, whose team is leading that effort. Hi, everybody. He got to talk about the fun stuff, so I get to talk about the mechanics of the process. But before I get started, I just want to dissuade you that there is no truth to the rumor that we coordinate the selection of our ties in the morning together. So that was strictly by accident, but uh, I thought that was rather interesting. The process. First off, this is the most inclusive process of which I've ever been a part of or seen in 25 years at Houston Community College. And he's talked a little bit about that, but I'd like to, to commend the good work of my colleague, Dr. Michael Edwards, I'd like to mention Lisa Crawford sitting in the back and also Elizabeth Scherer because they form the nucleus of the workhorses that have really put this plan together in terms of just the mechanics of it. And I really appreciate their good work. I'm making the presentation, but they deserve the credit. So just a little bit about how the, the plan was put together. We have a strategic planning advisory council. And you should have received a letter in your mailboxes, your, your inboxes recently from me about this. And essentially, the Strategic Planning Advisory Council consists of people from outside the college. We wanted input from our stakeholders out in the community. So it's a, it almost reads like a who's who. We invited everybody that we could possibly think of and still keep the committee size relatively small. People with experience in strategic planning, people that are prominent names in the community, representative of organizations that either can do uh, strategic planning on a regular basis or certainly that have good relationships with the institution and want to have input. So that was the Strategic Planning Advisory Council. It also consists of the vice chancellors who were a part of that. We've had a back and forth. Some of you, I think, in the audience are members of the work groups. We also put together work groups around the strategic pillars, and I'll get to that in just a second. But the work groups really are responsible for taking the advice and input from the SPAC, the Strategic Planning Advisory Council, and then coming up with the, the real fundamental elements that will comprise the strategic plan. So there's been this back and forth process as noted here. Now, one other thing that I want to note, the, um, we have conducted a survey, and you should have also received the survey in your inboxes. There is a survey that's been ongoing, and I want to tell you the response has been amazing. As of today, I, I counted before I came down, there were 817 responses internally 
to the survey. So you are providing input and your input will be used to help shape the elements of the strategic plan. We haven't even talked about the action plans and the individual units. We'll get to that. But the point is that survey is your mechanism if you're not on one of the work groups. And the work groups have, I think, about 100 people in total on them. But the community and college survey will be your avenue by which to provide input to us as to what you deem important in this strategic plan. I think that's very important and I appreciate the input. If you haven't filled it out, please do so. Uh, we're reading through all those comments uh, and we're looking at all the responses and it's been a very enthusiastic response and I appreciate that. And then the, the, the next part of this is the chancellor is actually visiting all the colleges uh, for input into the, this is a listening tour and he's talked he sort of framed the general picture of what we're dealing with as an institution in the broader context of our state and our city. Um, I, I think he raises a valid point and as somebody that's been here a long time if you'll let me be an academic put my academic hat back on just for a minute. When I was sitting out at the colleges or even sitting here and I look at HCC and all the good things that we've done I always just think about what we could do. And there's a poem you should read sometimes, by, it's called Maud Muller, and there's a pivotal line in that poem and it says, of the all sad words known to tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. And I think about HCC and I just think about the tremendous potential of our faculty, our staff, and our students. I just think we could do so much more and so I like the idea of having a strategic plan based on your input and your elements and a broader vision that will allow us to do even more than what we've done for our communities because it really matters in the transformation of the lives of our students. So we're compiling all this data. We have a short timeline on this. Here is the, the very brief timeline. Normally a strategic plan takes approximately a year uh, we've been working on it and we'll have worked on it in total about four months before it's approved by the Board of Trustees. So we've had a very compressed timeline. I know we didn't wait for the last minute to get started. It's just one of those things. We've had this transformation year where we've gone through things. I've been here in this building about six months. Um, sometimes it seems like two days and sometimes it seems like ten years. But nonetheless, um, time is, is marching on. We've got a short time horizon here for completion of our strategic planning process. And then here is, uh, this is just, this slide uh, just shows what we're building. So it's, it's, like, it's like a building. Our mission, our core values, and our competencies form the foundation of what we're doing with respect to our strategic plan. You can see the input processes, the transformation, uh, group, the Strategic Planning Advisory Council, Strategic Planning Work Groups, the online survey, the listening tours, and then here are the four pillars, and I think you've, you've seen this before, but innovation, student success, performance excellence, and organizational stewardship. You know, to be truthful, those are common to most strategic plans, so that's not a, a great reveal or anything, and that came as a response really, and from the input of both the G65, the transformation team, the cabinet, the board, et cetera. And so those are just the broad pillars. We get to fill in the other stuff. So, but I think what we're gonna do now is we're going to uh, uh, address any questions that you might have. You have an opportunity for input with those cards. We're gonna read all of those, and we've got a short timeline to read them. Uh, but we're, we've been reading the comments that have come in from the colleges. They've been very good so far, but we appreciate your input. And this is an opportunity now for you to ask questions about the strategic planning process uh, as it relates to what we're doing going forward for the college. So. This actually will go to the board in, in uh, December and the plan will become operational in January. One of the things where I think there's been a disconnect in the past, you've been here as long as I have, one of the disconnects is that we haven't necessarily tied the budget directly into the strategic plans. So there's a huge disconnect so we, you know, we, we say we're going to do this and then this comes up and we spend the money over here. The Chancellor has made a promise that we will absolutely link 
the budgetary process to the strategic planning process, because otherwise this is meaningless. I think you're aware that we are in the process of uh, acquiring a software that will allow us, allow all of you to have direct input into the strategic plan in terms of making sure that all of it aligns appropriately, that there's feedback mechanisms, that we can see, we, we can actually track what you guys are doing with respect to the goals and initiatives that you've formulated in your, in your work groups or your units around the strategic planning process. But you raise a good point and that is, so what happens if things change? Well, this was always intended, correct? This has always been intended to be an iterative plan to the extent, and the Chancellor mentioned that just briefly. We have to be responsive to change, and I don't, you know, we're, we're actually more adept and more nimble than universities typically are, but having said that, that's as, that's as far as we go with it. Uh, um, there's, there's ways that we can be more reactive, and so the plan can't be static. We can't just have a plan and we stick with the plan forever no matter what happens. You know, it's like driving a bus off a cliff. We can't do that. We've got to be responsive to change and think about the jobs that we thought were forever jobs that are now gone and think about careers that, you know, I've never even heard of. I mean, what's it? I didn't even, well, I, I knew, I was dimly aware that there was something known as analytics and now that's part of my job title. Um, <laughs> So you, you, you get the idea, That's, that has become, you know, data analyst has become a really big position. Social experience coordinator for social media, whoever thought that that job would have existed five years ago? And who would have thought that bank teller jobs were ever going to go away or be diminished? Well, the ATM obviated the need for it. And while he talked about the potential for jobs with uh, autonomous cars, the truth is, it's going to put a whole lot of people out of a job initially. Just think about it. All of the people that are in the driving business and doing all the things, why do you need them? So if we don't respond to that and react to that and have plans that you know, are adaptive, we're going to really be left behind. And I think that's one of the things that we have an obligation to our communities and to our students. So what if they graduate with a degree? If a degree doesn't get you a decent job, then we really haven't, we've done them a disservice because we've taken their time and their money and now they're smarter, but they still can't get a job. So that doesn't help them. Other questions? That's a really good question and there are so many elements to it. So for instance, one of the things that's come up repeatedly as we've moved towards the centers of excellence concept is the whole idea of, well, we're focusing attention in certain areas and by definition they seem to be geographically based, right? There's, there's centers of excellence throughout the institution but they're located in very specific places. Well, part of that is a budget necessity and part of it is just a logical structure. For instance, Coleman is its own center of excellence. We cannot replicate some of those very expensive programs at Coleman across all of the colleges, nor does it necessarily make sense. Having said that, though, there are parts of the, of the Coleman uh, programs that certainly can work out at the colleges, some of the, certainly the preliminary courses, but some of them, and then they can feed into Coleman for the conclusion. That's the way it's working right now with engineering as an example. You can take your pre-engineering courses anywhere throughout the, the uh, college, but for some of the more specialized ones, you're going to ultimately end up back at the Northwest College, you know, at that particular center of excellence because, quite frankly, that's where UT Tyler's located, and if you're trying to get into that engineering program there, a lot of the students are sort of gravitating there because it's creating a natural community. I don't think that it was ever intended, though, that we just, we take every resource, put it into a singular center of excellence, and there's nothing out for our far-flung communities. Because, you know, there are issues in Houston with driving, there's issues in transportation. Some of our students, you know, rely on public transportation, quite frankly, to get from one point to the other, and the bus route doesn't go to everywhere in all of our campuses. 
So you can't just put every single thing uh, at only at a specific location. The communication piece, absolutely essential that no matter where the center of excellence is, that they're dealing directly, and, and, and I can't speak to exactly how that's working at the moment because we're, we've just implemented it, but theoretically there should be good communication between those campus sites and the center of excellence in terms of we have to maintain program quality and consistency. We absolutely have to. And quite frankly, that's been a deficit at Houston Community College. We've had, and, and part of that is resources, right? So this campus has really good resource. This one does not. And that's even within colleges. So how do we address that? That goes to the centers of excellence in part. And what the theory was is that if you have a center of excellence and it's focused here, you know, put lots of really high-tech resources here and, and make sure that it can, it, it's an exemplar for the rest of the system. Maybe there's some feeders that can come in for some of the preliminary stuff, but you, you have, we have to, we're in a competitive marketplace. We, you know, we're competing against Lone Star, against increasingly Blend and Wharton, all these others. We want to have exemplary centers of excellence where people say, you know what, I'm choosing Houston Community College as my destination of choice. And so to do that, we have to concentrate those resources accordingly. I don't see that a, the location of an individual that reviews, that does the degree audit uh, is necessarily germane. I think it's the, uh, in 2015, we have data systems that allow people to even get to the point, our students to get to the point where you have to do that level of, uh, that level of work, that amount of work in degree audits. It's not as easily as automating, but automation is a big part of the solution. Uh, if we check the data, if we had software systems that check the data when it gets put in and flash the screen red saying, can't accept this because this isn't right, uh, ha having checked it against some database, um, the, the, uh, the number of audits that are required should drop considerably. The, one of the challenges with, with assigning people at a specific location is we lose the opportunity of the scale. So one, if, if we do it by location, one location might, might have far less of a demand than another. So we don't, we can't share in that capacity. So I view the, uh, this being agnostic in terms of location, but it's something that, uh, based on volume, until we get our data systems to the point where they're effective, we will look at increasing capacity to deal with those, uh, the, the audits. So I, I don't, I'm not, I guess it looks like I'm skirting saying, yes, we're gonna hire two more people. I don't know, but it makes, it, it makes sense and it's a good argument that until we get our data systems right, that there is a demand and at the end, if we're focused on the student experience, right, that's the driving issue, increasing resources as a result of that. So the sequence would possibly pay out like this is we're gonna increase capacity to do that by adding staff, but also begin to work on our data systems to reduce the number of audits that are required. And then, uh, and and then the next step is reduce, align uh, our capacity with what the new demands are post the improvement in our data systems. Thank you.
2015, I can argue that that's where we should be as one of the largest community colleges in the country. And I'm committed to getting us there over the next couple of years to support your work in that student completion. The more information you have, the more information the student has, the easier it is to answer the question, what do I need to do to complete? There's a considerable amount of work that's been done in the psychology of that. Um, you know, when I set a goal for, uh, in, health wise and in, in how much I run or how much I weigh uh, or how many calories I burn, um, when it's on my wrist and it's reminding me uh, every couple of hours, it's something that is upfront that I need to deal with as opposed to I have a journal and I go write it down once a week. I'll try to go look at it today. Oh, I, I, where did I leave that journal? I, it's around here somewhere. I get, so all of those excuses go away. Now it's up to me and my willpower. I've got the data, but we can't even ask, uh, require that of our students right now because that information is difficult to get. It's nobody's fault in terms of not doing their job here at, at HCC. It's just the, the, the style and design of our data systems haven't focused on that. They focused on other areas. We have a lot of compliance issues that eat up a lot of our resources. There's not a whole lot left for these other neat things that we see at conferences that we go to, that we see demos on, 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 uh, on webcasts. So we're gonna be moving toward uh, a plan in our, in the strategic plan, a, a methodology that will get us there that will support us going to the board and asking for a few million dollars to do this specific project. That's something that the board can hold us accountable for saying in eight months, they wanna see the demo of this thing uh, functioning and being used in our, uh, uh, across our entire system. That w we're okay with that level of accountability and responsibility, but the board in, in doing their job needs to know what we're gonna do with that money that we're asking for. And that's part, an embedded part parcel to the strategic plan. Thank you for the comment. As, as we've started the move to, to the cloud, the staff needed to support some of the things that are, that are in 2015 perfunctory, like email, for example, uh, are things that we should move that are common, that we can move outside our organization for support. There are things that are mission critical to our organization that we can't and shouldn't and won't uh, push out. As we grow and as we grow in our uh, effectiveness using systems, absolutely we do need more support staff for those things that are critical. Some of it might come in terms of repurposing staff. You know, when um, this is, we're doing it right now, um, we're, we're kind of late in the game and moving email to a, a third party. Um, where I was at before, we went from internally servicing email to having uh, Google service it. Our email support staff uh, went from a very large number, uh, we were, this was a statewide system, to uh, let's say it went from over 50 to about 10. Uh, th those people that were, uh, who were no longer needed to service email were put on projects dealing with student services and delivering of information, uh, analytics and other areas. So your, your, uh, your point's well made that we're becoming more and more dependent on these systems that we need to make sure that the support of those systems is in place. Sure, that, that's, that's in, in, embedded in the strategic plan and you know, the 10752, uh, we start with five, we, we end up with two. So uh, it, in terms of return for, from investment, we're almost better off focusing on the ones 
on, on retaining than the new ones coming in because there's three of them and uh, based on the current ratio statewide. Um, you know, retention is a metric of completion. It, it's, uh, it is uh, in the path to completion. So without retainage, without retaining a student, they'll never complete. So there, that is, and, and in our alert system, we're looking at different levels of, of alert. We're looking at, uh, and we currently measure them uh, returning as, we count them as returning students. And we're gonna be, uh, certainly are already, but working on how to distribute data and put it up on a dashboard on what we're doing with the students that started here and left after one semester. How do we reach out to them? How do we find out what their challenges were? So all of those are discussions that we're having, and th that is very people intensive. Uh, you know, that's very difficult to automate. So that does come with a, a, a resource demand that we're also looking at uh, staffing up. When that strategic plan comes forward, we're gonna be looking at cost implications and embedding that into our budget request. So it'll drive our budget for the next three to five years. Discussing common titles and uh, even the difference between, uh, aside from pay ranges, why do we need uh, what's the difference between dean, uh, executive director, director? We, we need to look at how the, out, how the external groups look at us. When they talk to the head of the Global uh, Energy Training Center, uh, is that a director or is that a dean? When I go to meetings with industry and there are deans there, uh, the title dean means something to them. The title director, that not so much. Uh, I'll share with you an experience I had. I called our main number and I asked for Dr. Butch Herod. <laughs> Couldn't find him. I said, well, man, his name's not Butch. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. And the person on the phone says, well, I, if you don't know his name, I, I don't, there's, we have several Herods, I don't know which one. Oh, he's a vice chancellor. Well, I don't know, I don't have titles. Um, and I had my caller ID turned off, and not that my name would pop up, but I wanted to get the typical response, and that's not acceptable. And it's not the fault of the person answering the phone. They wanted to help. It's, what's their screen look like? And I'm afraid to ask, are they actually looking at paper, trying to find instead of a screen? So. Um, we're working on that. We're aware of the difficulty in just connecting the right people. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. We'll be hearing some more about our strategic plan rollout, uh, and um, we look forward to sharing some more uh, about our strategic plan as we get closer to its rollout. Thank you. Thank you.